these are animals. So is coral. It has a mouth, tentacles, and a stomach. But when we hear about coral, we're mainly taught that it's not doing well. But here, in one of the most unlikely places, something incredible is happening. It's a story of resilience, of adaptation, and maybe a glimpse into the future of our oceans. It all started on a tiny man-made island, a quiet miracle in the shape of a peanut. If you imagine all the conditions that a coral would naturally thrive in, Peanut Island is basically the exact opposite. At low tide, there are areas where corals are as, as shallow as three feet of water, being close, very close to the top. Um, there's temperature differences, so they're a lot exposed to the temperature since they are so shallow, so whatever the surface temperature of the water is, that's what they're dealing with. In the hot summer months, it can get really warm up into the 90s degree Fahrenheit, and in the winter, it can get pretty cold. The most ideal waters for corals to grow in um, are obviously clarity, so clear water. That You think of that pretty blue turquoise Bahama water. Clear for a couple of reasons. They need sunlight and so that they can feed uh, properly. Water that's only in a certain temperature range as well. So it can't be too hot, they get stressed. If it's too cold, they get stressed. Low sedimentation, so low amounts of sand or other things in the water. Traditionally, we've thought that, that corals need pristine conditions to survive. And yet, as time has gone on, we've kind of found that there's a bit of a gray area where corals are able to survive in a lot of different habitats. And I think that speaks to their remarkable ability to adapt to different environments. And that's what gives me the most hope for their persistence under environmental change. Despite the less than ideal conditions, Coral have decided to call Peanut Island home. It raises a question, why here? To answer that, we have to go back in time to 1918. The island wasn't always here. It was built by people. And its history, it began with the Port of Palm Beach. The history of the Port of Palm Beach and Peanut Island is back in 1918. The farmers from out west in what we call the Glades area to the western port of the county basically went to the port commission and they basically said, look, if you can create an inlet here, we believe we can ship our goods out of here and it would save us a lot of money. That's ballpark how it started. And then in the 1920s, as we started dredging more and more, the island, which is Inlet Island, which is now Peanut Island, was created. And for the next six decades, that was used as the dredge material site. And all of the dredge material would go onto Peanut Island. And that's what formed the island itself. And then in the 1930s, you had the Coast Guard creating the Coast Guard station and also the boats and docks. Later on in 1961, uh, President Kennedy actually had a bunker built out on the island. If you remember back then, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis going on. And the thought was that if we ever had an attack, that's where the president would go. Later on after that, in 1994, we had the county agreement that allowed the port and the county to join forces and the county to go ahead and establish a park out on Peanut Island. In 1999, they completed that park and it's been operated that way ever since. So beginning in 1998, the county began an environmental restoration and passive park project uh, on the island. And uh, they completed it in November of 1999. And then later on in, in 2004, 2005, uh, we did a phase two, which included uh, the snorkeling lagoon and uh, some of the, the other enhancements, uh, making it uh, a really great place to visit for people that uh, wanted to do water activities. And then in 2012, 2013, we came back in and, and uh, installed some breakwaters, uh, did some work on the jetties for the lagoon to make uh, the water flow a little bit better, to clear it, make the water clearer, and, and uh, turned it into a really nice project. The island was built, and over time, it became a local landmark. P9 
people came to boat, explore, and enjoy the warm waters. Even wildlife began to settle in. But the secret to what makes this island so beautiful, it's in the water. And the Gulf Stream, it plays a big part in how these waters move. Just offshore, the Atlantic's most powerful current flows northward, a warm, fast-moving river in the sea. The Gulf Stream sweeps past the Palm Beach coast, moving millions of gallons of water every second. At high tide, a portion of that flow is pulled through the Lake Worth Inlet. It fills the lagoon with fresh, clean ocean water. And as the tide falls, the older waters push back out. It's a rare kind of coastal exchange, engineered by people, powered by ocean physics. This portion of Palm Beach County comes closest to the Gulf Stream current than any other location in the continental US. So our county and department decided, let's tap into that. Let's put this lagoon on the southeast corner of Peanut Island, where at every high tide, that beautiful clear Gulf Stream water is gonna come in through the inlet and pushes out the water that was in there previously from the low tide cycle, brings in water that is a bit cooler as it comes from the Gulf Stream, most likely carrying um, small, tiny organisms that corals filter out of the water and eat. And as that tide cycle switches to low tide, the water from the Lake Rift Lagoon, which is typically tannic or brown um, and can be a bit cooler, um, or hotter depending on the time of the year, but not ideal for corals, will come into the snorkel lagoon through low tide. But the corals and the, the creatures that are in the lagoon now seem to be able to thrive through that tidal cycle swing. So they'll have crystal clear, perfect temperature waters from the Gulf Stream at high tide, and then they can be in less desirable, darker waters um, at low tide, and they still continue to thrive. And we've been able to really utilize this natural um, effect that happens twice a day and create this snorkel location for people to interact with these marine creatures that they probably never would be able to. What makes the discovery of coral thriving in the lagoon even more extraordinary is the state of coral just miles away. Florida's reef tract was once vibrant and sprawling, but it's been declining for decades. Warming oceans, poor water quality, disease, it hasn't been one problem, it's been many. In South Florida, corals are hurting. In a lot of ways, it's death by a thousand cuts because we have so many co-occurring stressors that are impacting coral health here. We've, we've been moving water away from the Everglades into highly managed canals that bring it out to the coastlines, and that water contains a lot of runoff, nutrients, sediments that end up on our coral reefs. And uh, so these corals have been facing declining water quality for decades. In recent years, we've started to see increasing marine heat waves leading to coral bleaching and disease outbreaks that have really decimated populations in Southeast Florida. Despite all the problems, in this little pocket of engineered shoreline, coral are growing, not just surviving, but thriving. And the question now isn't just why here, it's what can this teach us? Got it? All right, well, let's go. The Reef Institute does research in the coral at Peanut Island, so we looked at it and saw that it was such a unique and amazing spot and that the corals were doing so well. Why could that possibly be happening? The consistent bulk of what we do is research on the bleaching activities out there. So we saw these corals and we saw that Every year during the summer months, they were bleaching and getting really white. But then during the winter months, we saw all that color coming back. It was taking that algae back in. And we wanted to see, was that just an anomaly for one year or was that consistently happening? So we started taking data. We try to go out once a month, if not multiple times during a month. And we take a picture with a ruler within the picture and we get the whole colony of the coral. And then after we have that picture, we come back to the lab and we measure the area. Then we also have a researcher who goes and takes a coral bleach watch card and she looks next to the coral and she looks at what color it is to see, is it bleached? Is it recently bleached? Is it more on the healthier side gaining the color back or is it like the brightest color that it could be? So we have seen that over the past three or four years that we've been doing it, it's a consistent cycle. So during the summer, they'll bleach, all the corals will become white, and then during the winter, they will become just these vibrant colors. Because the corals have been growing and doing so well there, it has gained the attention of other organizations that have been able to partner with us and do further research. 
So we've had organizations that have come and taken samples of the coral and actually found out that they have the most heat tolerant version of that algal symbiont or algae that they have the relationship with. We've also had an organization come and take cores of the coral to see if they are spawning and actually having babies. So are they not just growing, but are they actually releasing babies? We haven't gotten the results back to that data, but we're hoping to very soon. Those are the two main studies we've done. We've had plenty of organizations come through and take samples for many different reasons, but those are the biggest studies we've done. The research happening here is becoming part of a larger idea. Across Florida, organizations like NOAA and the University of Miami are studying corals in places like Peanut Island. They're trying to understand what helps them survive in challenging human-altered environments, and they're calling them urban corals. Urban corals are such an interesting thing because when I originally said that we, we thought that corals need perfect environments to survive in, urban corals throw all of that out the window. So what we've been finding is that corals have been settling and thriving on these extremely urbanized habitats inside of ports. We don't know for certain why urban corals are able to survive in such harsh environments, but we think that it's, it's partly due to the fact that they're constantly experiencing environmental fluctuations, where just like in humans, if we are in an environment that is not comfortable for us, our body starts to change physiologically to adapt to that. We think corals are doing the exact same thing and uh, it leaves them in this constant state of readiness, that they're ready to eat if there's food in the area. They're ready to ward off invaders if there's pathogens that they're exposed to. They're ready to withstand bleaching if the temperatures get too hot. Or if it does stay too hot, they are ready to bleach, but then also recover. They're like coral gyms. These, these corals are constantly being exposed to stress every day, day in, day out, sometimes more than once a day with tidal cycles. And the corals, we, we think of it as just bulking up. They're always ready to handle anything that's thrown at them. If coral can thrive in a man-made lagoon, what else is possible? What if these urban survivors are part of the answer? Right here in Florida, in our own backyard, Scientists are researching how these corals are surviving in human-altered environments. The idea is simple. Identify what's working and use it. Propagate, restore, rethink the way we protect our reefs. How can those corals help in their resiliency to the corals offshore of our natural reefs? Could those corals be more resilient and could those more resilient corals be beneficial for future outplanting and growing of the reefs and restoration of the reefs? So there's something in that water that's making them happy and making them want to do well. They're just tougher. They're tougher than the average coral. And hopefully, as a result, we can capitalize on that. We can propagate those corals, grow them out in land-based facilities, and then outplant them back onto the reef. We might find the answers here, in a place no one expected, a man-made island flushed by the Gulf Stream and full of life. We didn't plan it this way. But maybe that's the point, because in the middle of a changing ocean, the answers might not come from untouched places, but from the ones we've already touched. If a man-made island can give coral a second chance, imagine what you might find in your own backyard. Other cities can learn from our experience with Peanut Island of having a piece of land that really was just for dredged material and turned it into a, this beautiful county park now. Mother Nature has, you know, her own mind and we have to try and work with that rather than against it. Stay curious, support reef safe choices, explore what's around you. Our planet is full of surprises. We just have to get out there and find them. <laughs>